Finally, the men said in the very next verse, in verse 5 of Daniel chapter 6, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So they use that as a, a tool or tactic to try to bring about his destruction. And of course, they brought about their own in the end. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. The decree is signed, cannot petition any God for a period of 30 days. Anyone except the king. The decree is signed, verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And if anyone does, of course, they'll be thrown in the lion's den. He went home and in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since early days. From a young man to an old man, from Daniel chapter 1 till now, here late in his life, there's consistency in his character, is there not? From the very first time we're introduced to Daniel that he purposed in his heart, he's not going to foul himself for the king's food and wine and delicacies. To this point, late in his life, Again, not that he was perfect, he never sinned. We know he did. For all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God, even Noah, Job, and Daniel. And yet, their overall character is described to us in Scripture as being blameless and upright. Unimpeachable character. But what do we find concerning the children of God when we come over to the New Testament? Let us give brief consideration to the unimpeachable Christian. The unimpeachable Christian. What about elders in the church? What does Paul say about elders in the church? Well, in writing to Titus, who was on the island of Crete, notice there with me, beginning in verse 5 of Titus chapter 1, For this reason, I left you in Crete that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I command you. If a man is, what's the first thing said? If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children not accused of dissipation or insubordination. Verse 7, I thought he already said it. He did, but he repeats it. He says again, for a bishop must be what? Blameless. As a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, lover, what is good and sober-minded, just holy, self-controlled, holding fast the word as he has been taught, that he may be able, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and convict those who contradict. And we'll pause there. But twice stated, verse six, and then again in verse seven, a bishop and elder. That's what we're talking about. Said in order things that are lacking the churches, appoint elders in every church. Another term for elders, bishop, overseers, pastors, shepherds, but here a bishop must, must be blameless. He must have possessed that character in his life. Consistent, again, we're not talking about men who are, are perfect, never sinned before. But those in the church know these men in their lives and their character to say, yes, everything we know about him. Overall, we can describe him as being blameless. That's the kind of life he lives. And so, and along with the other qualifications, and if he's blameless, don't you think the other ones are going to plug in pretty well? If he's, no wonder that's the first one, right? Think about it. If this is a blameless man, he's not going to be self willed. If he's a blameless man, he's not going to be quick tempered, right? He's not going to be a hothead. I mean, give a doubt called wine, intoxicating drink. He's not going to be violent. He's not going to be greedy for money, and so on and so forth. Why? Because of his character, his integrity. He's a blameless man. It makes sense. That's the first thing stated in the qualifications here. And it makes sense that it's repeated twice. We find, of course, the same earlier in 1 Timothy chapter 3, where Paul says to the younger evangelist Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, this is a faithful saying that any man desires the position of a bishop. He desires 
a good work, a bishop then must be what? What's the first one again? He must be blameless. He must be blameless. These men must be like Noah. These men must be like Job, like Daniel of old. If they're going to be shepherds of my brethren in these local churches, they must have this kind of impeccable, unimpeachable character. But it's not just those who would serve and lead as elders in churches. It's also said of deacons. If you're there in First Timothy chapter 3, how convenient, because that's where we're going next. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 8, likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons being found what? Being found blameless. But notice what Paul says here. Let these also first be tested. So the men who would be considered to serve as elders in a local church, they're to be tested. We're considering them. We got to test them. We got to examine. Same thing though, set up deacons. Let these first also be tested. Then let them serve as deacons, being found blank. And so they've been examined. Their character has been considered by the congregation. And they've proven themselves. They passed the test, or they didn't pass the test, whatever the case may be, right? Well, they need more time. They need more growth. They need some more maturity spiritually. And, and that's it's okay if that's the case. As long as that that progress and that growth is, is and that development takes place for all of us, for those who would serve as deacons. But if they're bound to be like us, we need these other qualifications. Then yes, we need these special servants in the Lord's church. And then even some things are said about the wives, not just the men. The whole family dynamic matters when it comes to leaders and servants in the church who would be appointed. And yet, it's not just elders and deacons. One thing that I've observed in my studies and lessons and classes on this subject is that almost every qualification that must be met by men who would serve as elders is also stated about Christians in general, with a few exceptions. But most on the list, as you list those out, you'll find the same things God requires as demands of all of us. And so really, as Christians, we are to strive to have an unimpeachable character in our lives, again, it doesn't mean we're not going to be without error, without sin. It does not mean we're not going to mess up. Oh, maybe mess up bad with sin sometimes. But our overall character in life should be able to be described in this way. Philippians chapter 2. Let's look at some passages that specifically are directed toward the saints in general, this being one of them written to the saints in Philippi. In Philippians chapter 2, again, verses 14 through 16. Do all things without complaining and disputing or arguing that you may become, notice that you may become what? Blameless. And harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Holding fast to the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I had not won in vain or labored in vain. There's so many things tied to being blameless. We may not think, if Paul had not put it in this context, typically uh, thinking of someone who's blameless. As well, that's someone who doesn't want it. And that's someone who doesn't argue and dispute. I'm not talking about defending and contending for the faith, but arguing and dispute. Complain, like Israel of old did so often. Well, that's part of having a character that is blameless, as is holding fast the word of life, as is verse 15, being a light. 
in a crooked and perverse generation among whom we shine as lights. And we can't shine as lights if we're not what? Godly, upright children of God. Those with the kind of character that we're talking about this morning. Those thoughts, those beautiful words of the hymns led into, in particular, after the lesson that I appreciate him reading, more holiness given. And you go back and look at those verses. They're powerful. The request that hopefully we're sincerely making let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. Strive to be blameless. The beauty of Jesus will be seen in you and in me. First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. First Thessalonians 5, 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The English Standard Version reads, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit and soul and body be, be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Preserved, kept. In other words, we, again, live this consistent life the few days we have upon this earth striving to be blameless children of God in the midst of a sinful, wicked world and be preserved that way, kept that way until the coming of our Lord. It matters greatly to be found in such a state as Peter makes abundantly clear as Brother Bill read for us earlier in our scripture reading this morning. Go back to that text with me, please. Second Peter chapter 3. Verses 11 through 14. <clears throat> In fact, let me go ahead and grab 10. Start at 10 with me, please. Second Peter 3. But the day the Lord will come as a thief of the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, Peter says, to those he's writing to Christians today, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven, a new earth, in which righteousness dwell. Note verse 14. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot in what? Blankness. Just can't get away from it. There it is again. <clears throat> I certainly don't want to be found by him with spot in white. I don't want to be found by him with an impeachable character but with unimpeachable character. Again, not because I'm perfect. We've been saved by grace through faith. It's by his grace and mercy ultimately that we'll be saved, but he does expect us to live by his standard. And as we think about, well, we know the Lord's coming and we know that he can come at any time. It could be today. We don't know. That's the thing about it. You gotta be ready. And so even back here, almost 2,000 years ago, Peter is saying, you need to keep this before you because you don't know when he's going to come. The day the Lord's going to come, we just don't know he's going to come as a thief of the night. But knowing what's going to happen when he comes and the wrath is going to come upon this world and the destruction and the punishment, then what manner of persons ought we to be in holy conduct and godliness? We we're looking forward to these things. And so be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blame. Do you remember one of the definitions we provided at the beginning of the lesson of the word unimpeachable? Unimpeachable, blameless, exemplary of a person's character, completely honest and moral. Should not such describe every child of God who has been called to be holy as he is holy? 
in all of our conduct, 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. Ought not that describe every Christian who's called upon to not be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, by that perfect and acceptable will of God in Romans 12, 2? Ought that not to be tr true of those who are called upon to not love the world or the things in the world? Lust of flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. And to possess the characteristics of citizens of the heavenly kingdom, as Jesus speaks of in the beautiful Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in those Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit. As he begins the sermon, what is he talking about? He's talking about your character and my character that we possess, our character qualities. He wants those who make up his kingdom to be blameless, to be of unimpeachable character, poor in spirit, humble, those who mourn and be comforted, those who are meek and inherit the earth, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Ought oh, that not to be true of us if we're truly citizens of his kingdom that we do possess and strive to possess and strive to grow in those areas of those character qualities? Because we want to be like Noah and Job and Daniel of old. Blameless. <clears throat> oh, that not to be the case of those who are to be a salt to the earth, a light to the world, that that's our character. To those who are called upon not to practice the works of the flesh, of Galatians 5, 19 through 21, but to have the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, Galatians 5, 22 through 24. Against such there is no law. And what about those of us, which is all of us, who are New Testament Christians who are called upon to imitate our Savior, Jesus Christ? Walk in his steps, Peter said, 1 Peter chapter 2, 21. Here's the thing, brethren, if we're striving and really walking in his steps, you know what kind of character we'll have? Unimpeachable. Blameless. New Testament saints ought to be known as those who, uh, as those possessing unimpeachable character. Like Daniel of old in the workplace. Remember, as you as you look back at in, in the book of Daniel in chapter six, and, and what did they try to find fault in the area? So the governors and the satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, his job, his workplace, right? New Testament has something to say about our workplace, doesn't it? Ephesians 6, Colossians 3. Yeah. Sure, but how do you know in the workplace? We talked about this earlier. The lesson recently. Do they know that you're a Christian? Are you a secret disciple? Hopefully not. But then what do they know about your character? We should stand out because we're striving to have a blameless, unimpeachable character. Like Daniel, couldn't find any fault. They tried. What about in the community? What about by our neighbors? What about among our brethren? Do we possess such a character? Peter stated, as we just studied and read together in 2 Peter 3, he stated that we certainly should, especially in view of the Lord's judgment upon this wicked world, and how we should want to be found by our Lord Jesus on that day. <clears throat> How would Jesus find you now? How would he find me now? If he came today, returned today, would he find me with blame or would he find me blameless? Because of the life we're striving to live. Let's extend the Lord's invitation. You think about unimpeachable character, someone who was truly perfect without sin was only Jesus Christ. 
In fact, that's the way he's described multiple times throughout Scripture. The spotless Lamb of God. That's what we're redeemed by, as Jason read earlier, his blood. But as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, as the Lamb of God that was perfect, that was sinless, that was who our sacrifice was. And it's because of his precious blood that we can be made perfect. Spotless. Our sins washed away. And then, as we have free will to obey or disobey him, to follow him or not follow him, after we make the decision to obey him and become a Christian, we have to continue to make the decision every day to follow him. And when we sin, there is his blood <coughs> to make us perfect again. 1 John 1 9. If we'll humble ourselves, confess, and repent. Maybe as a child of God, you need to do that this morning. Or maybe you're not a child of God yet. And so you need to obey the gospel. You need to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. John 3 16. You need to repent of your sins. Acts 2 38. You need to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart God raised him from the dead. Romans 10 9 and 10. And you need to be baptized. Water's right behind you. You need to be immersed, buried with him. Baptized into his death, Romans 6, 3. That your sins may be washed away, you may be raised to walk in newness of life, Romans 6, 4. Can't force you. We'll try to persuade you. We'll plead with you. And then strive to live a blameless life before him. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, you make it known as we stand. I'm